let's talk a little bit about animal communication. And in general, communication is one party giving information to another party somehow. And it doesn't even have to be one to one, it could be one person giving, or one animal, if we're talking about animal communication, giving information to many other many other animals. And communication doesn't even just have to happen between animals. There's a, a plant can actually communicate to an animal uh, through its appearance or by releasing certain chemicals. But we'll focus in this video on animal communication. And it's interesting because we, even we humans are animals. And the more that we think about this, the more types of communication we'll see around us. And it'll be interesting to think about why we do that communication and how we do it. So let's think about the types of animal communication. So we can think of visual, visual communication. Just me drawing a diagram like that is a form of visual communications. So we could have things like pictures, pictures, diagrams, writing. Writing's interesting because it's conveying kind of thought, ideas. It is conveying information and it's something you look at. So I would, I would put writing here, writing. You have even more basic types of visual communication, even if we stick to uh, human beings. Uh, the most obvious one I can think of is facial expressions. If you see someone who, is, who seems, who has a smile like that, and you know, they, they seem very approachable. It feels like, hey, they're communicating, even if they're not consciously doing it, that hey, you can approach me, I'm friendly, why don't you come talk to me, where uh, we, we can hang out. While if someone looks like this, where they're kind of glaring, where someone looks like this, then you might say, okay, this person doesn't look like they want to be bothered uh, right now. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not interested in, in messing with that person. And when you think about uh, facial expressions, it's very, it's very fundamental for us human beings, but why do, why, are we, why do we view this one on the left as more friendly and this one on the right as more aggressive? Well, it's through uh, millions of years of, of evolution that these things just came about and we recognize uh, kind of an aggressive posture or a friendly posture in our own species and in other species as well. We know when a dog is, uh, uh, is, is showing its teeth that okay, maybe I don't wanna mess with it as much, but if it's wagging its tail, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's in a friendly mood. And similarly, it's not just pictures and diagrams and writing and facial expressions. It could be body postures. This is true of humans, it's also true of other animals. There's a whole TED talk on these power poses, these poses that you can take on that can kind of establish your, your dominance in, in, a, in a, an environment, especially with other humans, but it's probably not just humans, probably also with other animals. You'll also see if you watch you know, these, these uh, nature specials on TV, animals striking certain poses that exhibit their dominance in some way or their position in some type of a social hierarchy. You also have animals, just by the nature of their appearance, that are communicating with other animals. For example, there's a lot of animals that by their coloration, they're signaling to other animals that, hey, it's probably not a good idea to eat me. For example, if this is a frog right over here, it's not that well drawn of a frog, but frogs are famous, especially some of the ones that have these vibrant colors, that these are signals to other potential predators that hey, you don't want to eat me. I will. I am poisonous. I will likely make you sick or even kill you if you eat me. And the predators know that it could either be innate through millions of years of evolution. Uh, the 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 ones that have learned to avoid the colors uh, live on and pass their genes, or it might be sometimes some type of learned behavior that they tried to eat one of these frogs once and it made them really sick, so they're going to avoid it again. As we know, visual isn't the only type of communication. In fact, normally when we talk about communications, we often think of speech and language, or spoken language. So I'll write that down, speech. So let me write, or let me write auditory. Auditory communication. And that could be speech. That could be, that could be, uh, this could be a, some type of a bark. A dog barking, saying, hey, stay away from here, uh, don't mess with me. It could be a roar, a lion's roar might be a way of saying, hey, I am dominant here, uh, don't come here. Or if you're a potential mate, if you're a lioness, saying, hey, look how nice my roar is, wouldn't you want to come and start a, a family with me? And it doesn't even have to be uh, something that kind of comes, comes from your throat. It could, be, it could be beating of the chest by a gorilla, 
uh, once again, to uh, exert its dominance in some way. It could be some sound that an animal does as a warning uh, to other animals to run away because it sees a predator. So we can keep thinking of more and more examples of each of these forms of communication. Now, other forms of communication that might be a little bit less obvious, you have chemical, chemical communication. So what's an example of chemical communication? Well, we, we know that a lot of animals, including dogs, like to uh, mark their territory with, uh, by, with urine. And when other animals come by, especially other dogs, they'll smell that urine that might have been applied to a tree someplace. It says, okay, uh, th this is some other dog's territory. I, I'm, I'm going to go someplace else. Uh, there's things like pheromones. Let me write this down. Pheromones. Pheromones are chemical signals. Even humans emit pheromones that are uh, not necessarily consciously, but subconsciously uh, sensed by other humans, and they can drive attraction uh, between those humans. So once again, it's chemical signals. One animal is giving information to another. Now, another form of communication, once again, not as obvious, is tactile. Tactile communication. And this could be a form of a kind of a nurturing touch by the mother to communicate to the child that it is safe. It could be a warning. Uh, you could imagine, you, you know, you're at a dinner party and uh, your, your significant other kind of uh, steps on your toe when you find yourself saying things that you shouldn't say. That's all tactile communication. Hey, don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the information that you're, you're starting to talk about something that, you, that, that you're not supposed to talk about. So now that we've talked about some of these general forms of, of communication, and I encourage you to just look around either your own life or just the animal world and think about all the forms of communication around you. Let's think about why animals actually communicate, including humans. And we often think ourselves as somehow beyond the natural world, but when you really think about it, most of our forms of communication fall into the categories we're about to talk about. One category is coordinate group behavior. Coordinate group behavior. So for example, if we are about to go uh, fight in a war, there might be communication about, well, how do we approach the enemy? In what order do we do it? Uh, it? It could be a team where we make a plan, either visual or auditory plan somehow. I, I, I don't know how you could actually do a chemical plan, but uh, that, that would be interesting. There's other things. You could be, um, you could be caring for the young as your main purpose for communication. Care for young. Once again, it could be something like tactile or, or even visual communication or auditory communication that makes the young feel nurtured, or you might be training them in some way. In fact, even this video, even the whole notion of Khan Academy, uh, it's a form of communication that you know, you could argue is about coordinating group behavior in some way, helping to educate more people so that they can participate in, in a better way. Or you could view it as caring for the young or, or some combination. But there's other reasons why you communicate. You could be defending territory. You could be, let me just in a new color. You could be defending, defending territory. Obviously, something like a no trespassing sign does it very explicitly. In fact, even a fence, the existence of a fence, is a form of communication. Uh, and obviously, in the animal world, we can think of it all the time with a bark or with you know, uh, uh, leaving your chemical signature on a tree to say, hey, uh, this is, don't, don't come here. This is my territory. And a, a very big role or, or use of communication that you'll see throughout the animal world even in humans, if you really think about it, is in finding a mate, is in finding a mate. You know, when someone goes by that fancy sports car, it's probably more than they need uh, just to get from point A to point B, but it might signal something to potential mates that, hey, I have a lot of earning power, or I'm flashy, or, or whatever else it might be. And related to that is you might want to signal some type of dominance. And that dominance might be for a potential mate, or it might be to defend your territory, tell other people to step aside, or that, hey, you should be the one that's coordinating the group's behavior instead of, instead of someone else.